Well, this is the part of chemistry that starts looking like chemistry in this whole chapter. There's so many calculations you're going to be amazed. How many calculations do you think there are? Zero. So you're amazed, right? There's no calculations. <laughs> like, you're what? All this time, you made me do all these stupid calculations. There's none in this chapter. There's more coming. We're just saving it for later. Okay? So we're going to talk about chemical reactions and how you know there's a chemical reaction first. So uh, you guys remember when you were a kid, you made those volcanoes? You did not make a volcano as a child? Good Lord. <coughs> Grew up in a cave or what? Okay, so, so in, in the children's volcano, we take sodium, right? Baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate, and we mix it with this crazy thing, which is acetic acid that's in vinegar. And what comes out of it is CO2 gas. That gives you the eruption, okay? And... There's some water, and there's actually sodium carbonate that gets formed in that process. And this is the stuff that smells like vinegar. Okay, this, all, this is vinegar, in vinegar, but this stuff also smells like vinegar when the volcano is done. So you would take paper mache. You've never, have, who's, who's never made a volcano? All right, you guys have to do this at home. There's actually much cooler things to do it with, but they're very dangerous. Okay. <laughs> Uh, one of the ones we used to use is, it was chromates, but chromates are so toxic they don't let us do it anymore. <laughs> but you just light it on fire and it makes this giant volcano. Anyways, uh, you take paper mache and you put it around like a soda bottle, okay? And then you make it look like a volcano and you can put a little food coloring in it and then baking soda, you fill it up and then you pour vinegar in it and then the, when the vinegar reacts with the baking soda, the sodium, car sodium bicarbonate, CO2 gas is evolved as big bubbles. And so the thing shoots out of the container, so it looks like a volcano erupting. And then you clean it all up and you start all over again. Okay, anyways. <sighs> uh, cars, all right? This is a, this is a hot topic uh, for our it, current environmental situation. I would just put it that way. Uh, octane from gasoline, you combine it with oxygen and it forms to make carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide is that greenhouse gas that uh, was discovered to be a greenhouse gas back in like the 1700s, I think. It was a long time ago. Um, it absorbs infrared radiation and then reflects it back to the earth. Uh, it's, if we didn't have any carbon dioxide, the earth would be too cold to live in. So we got to be careful like how much we have. Like we said, decide to get rid of all of it, we'd be screwed. If we make too much of it, we'd be screwed. <laughs> right? So we're kind of in that process right now. But this is a chemical reaction. And we, don't, we can't see actually molecules. This is octane. This is hydrogens and carbons strung together. What, is, what does oct mean? Eight, right? And so it's actually a hydrocarbon, hydrogen and carbon, C8H18. It doesn't always look like this. There's other forms of octane. They're branched usually. <clears throat> when you combine it with oxygen, this is what you get. Now, you don't get to see this part. This is carbon dioxide. There's carbon and two oxygen. This is water. There's an oxygen and two hydrogens. You don't get to see this part. But one of the keys of a chemical reaction is that new stuff gets made. You start with something, and you end with something different, okay? It's not just dissolving. It's not just phase changes. It's actually new things get made. We breathe out the same stuff. Yeah. So interestingly enough, like, you eat, see, oops. I like putting red as the color, but C6... Or sorry, it's not C6. You, uh, well, actually, this is what your body uses. So C6, H12O6, plus oxygen. Okay. Uh, and I'm not, I'll, bow, I'll do other stuff with this later. You end up with CO2, water, and heat. Engines also generate heat. It's actually a sign of a combustion reaction. We'll talk about combustion reactions. Uses oxygen, makes heat. 
So if you didn't know that, you could tell there's water vapor. All you need to do is get a mirror and breathe on it. And that water vapor that's coming from your breath is this water vapor that's from this chemical reaction. It's not just the water you've been drinking. Okay? The other thing to recognize is this reaction generates heat. It generates a lot of energy. Some of that energy gets to be used to make you, and the rest of it is just extra. So this is why we're warm-blooded. It's because we use this reaction to generate heat for our bodies. Okay. okay. Another interesting kind of uh, factoid thing. I just wanted, I like this one. Usually I don't talk about these slides, but this one's kind of fun. This is soap. In pure water, so that deionized water that we have upstairs, we rinse all our glassware with it, we wash stuff with it. This is hard water. This is like my mom's water. And you put soap in it, and what's the difference? All right, this one is much foamier, much soapier. And this one is actually got a lot of junk in here. This is actually soap scum. You guys know, like, you get in the bathtub, and you get a bar of soap, and you like, and then when you get out of the tub, there's all that junk stuck in the tub. The ring. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys don't take baths. No, huh? Everybody showers now. Dang. I like taking baths. Hot day? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a swimming pool. That's my swimming pool. Or I, I have, I shouldn't say this, I have a redneck swimming pool. The little kiddie pool. Yeah, I used to have one of those too. Get in that thing. That's awesome. It's just wet. Yeah, it's cold. But if I were to soap myself off in there and then try to rinse it out, there'd be this soap scum all over the inside, right? So, uh, yeah. This is especially true with hard water, correct? Yeah, so what, what's happening that this, right, is for regular water and this is for deionized water or pure water, okay? And it turns out that real, like regular water from the ground, from the minerals, has calcium and magnesium. These positive ions react with the ions for soap. Soap ions are negatively charged. They bind together with them and form a solid. And that's what the scum is that you see in here. So one of the things they used to uh, traditionally use for getting calcium and magnesium out is actually what's called washing soda. And washing soda, old school, you can still buy it, is sodium carbonate. Well, what's carbonate? Carbonate is CO3, 2 minus. So when you put washing soda in your hard water, this finds that because they're oppositely charged. They form a solid, precipitate out, and then the soap still stays in solution for doing the washing. And the reason you want soap in your water is because it helps remove all the body oils and things like that. It's really good at doing that, too. Okay. We'll talk a lot more about that. Okay, this is a long list, okay? How do you know a chemical reaction happens? I'm just going to do this and write this. New stuff is made. What stuff, like new compounds, get made? That's how you know there's a chemical reaction. We can't see all of this. We can't see stuff decomposing. We can't see new molecules forming, but you can detect them sometimes, and that's how we know a reaction takes place. Okay? Not everything is a chemical reaction. Okay, but here's, here's how we see a chemical reaction. All right, one is a color change. So like, the, actually, this, right? changes its form. The, there's a molecule in here that gives it a color, changes its form. So color change is an indicator of a chemical reaction okay, taking place. Um, another one's like this one. This is, uh, looks like, it almost looks like chrome, huh? I don't say what it is. But you notice, you notice how here this part of the solution is clear and you can see through it, okay? And then this solution's clear and you can see how he's pouring it in there. And this is not clear, it's opaque, okay? Anytime you can't see through the liquid, it's no longer clear. Like this is clear, but it's colored. 
This is clear, but it's not colored. But anytime you can't see through it, that's because a solid has formed in solution, and it's called a precipitate. Okay. So this stuff is a precipitate. It can, it's kind of like rain, right? It's precipitation, falls out from the sky. Well, it's precipitate in chemistry is a solid that falls out of the solution. Okay? If you wanted to see a precipitate at home, like a real simple one, you could just take your hard water and boil it. And actually solid will form inside of it. And that's actually like calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate. It's another way to get at it. Okay? So that's a precipitate. It's a solid that forms... in solution. The sugar crystals that you made the other day, those were a precipitate. They formed out of the solution and formed solid at the bottom. That's a precipitate. Okay. This kind of reaction is known as a precipitation reaction. because of the solid that gets formed. Okay, so color change, formation of a solid or a precipitation reaction, okay. Um, anybody know any others? Smell. Is that smell, yes. Why do you smell stuff though? <laughs> Don't, let's not get too well, like. Some stuff has a really like pungent odor already. Yeah, but but that could be coming from a reaction. But if you're doing a reaction and suddenly a new smell comes out, mm -hmm. why do you smell it? It gets in your nose. How does it get into your nose? It's a vapor. It's a vapor. It's a gas, right? So it turns out one of the components of a or one of the ways we tell there's a reaction is often we get the formation of a gas. So bubbles, right, is often a way that you see it. Okay, but not all gas forming reactions form bubbles, but you can smell it when it forms. Uh, the favorite one of young delinquent children of my generations was the, was the stink bomb. And it's the rotten egg smell. And we would take sodium sulfide, which I doubt you could still get, and then mix it with some sort of acid like HCl. Which, remember, that comes from swimming pools and all that kind of stuff. Or your mom, who's a chemist. Like, she brought me chemicals and dry ice and then left me alone. It didn't turn out too bad. Well, that's my opinion. So you get H2S, right? We would write it like this. It's a gas. We'll talk about the, how you des designate the states. You don't always see the bubbles that form from this, but you always smell it. I one time had a gas cylinder that was filled with this stuff. It was a little, what's called a lecture cylinder. It was like this big. And we use it for actually precipitation reactions. And I had a lab tech who was new. And he's like, oh, this thing looks empty. It feels that felt empty. It's a little cylinder. He, he's back, way back. Like in this building, it would be the equivalent of being in the other wing of the building from here. He just went like this. Psh, and gas came out, and we had to evacuate the floor. The smell got so strong that people were like, like, it just smells like sewage got released into every room. But this is the best part of my story. I was giving an exam. And all my students were sitting there doing their test, and then they start to smell like somebody farted. And they're all looking around in the classroom like, oh my god, who did that? So I have to go up to him like, no, 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 guys, he had this, and I you know, had to explain the whole H2S, hydrogen sulfide gas it form, and then I made him go outside and finish the test in the hall, like, because we have outside in our hallways, but it was hilarious. All these guys were like, in this case, he who dealt it was all the way across the building. 
Okay, so the other way, um, you get heat or light. So like a glow stick, like the nice things, and you crack them, right, and they glow like this. These are like my kids love these things. Or these cold packs, they get cold. Or like a stove generates light or heat, right? These are all signs of a chemical reaction. Now, you can be fooled into thinking you have a chemical reaction, too, because just because you see one of these things doesn't necessarily mean it's a reaction. Examples, face changes, right? When you're boiling water and it looks like a gas is being formed, yes, a gas is being formed, but it's a phase change. The bubbles in here are just made of H2O gas, and the liquid is H2O liquid, right? Same substance. Nothing new is being formed. In order for a chemical reaction to have taken place, something new would have had to have been formed. So any phase change is not a chemical reaction. Does it go back from, from steam to water? Yeah, because it can easily just go back from steam to water. But there's some chemical reactions that are reversible, lots, in fact. So it's not really necessarily a good test to tell whether or not, yeah, it's a phase change. Yeah, okay? So let's go through really quickly, identify these as... Chemical reactions or not, so butane burning in a butane lighter. Chemical change, right? Chemical reaction. So then uh, what is going to be the sign? How do you know? What are you seeing when you... You see a flame and you see, feel heat, right? So heat, a couple of things. Now, butane evaporating out of the butane lighter? That's just a phase change, right? Because it's butane to butane, so that's not a chemical reaction. Wood burning chemical because when you burn anything that has carbon in it, you get CO2 out and heat, right? So you're, you're going to have CO2, which you can't see, and you're going to have heat that comes out and light. Uh, dry ice subliming. So I don't know if I've mentioned subliming very much. That's just a phase change. It's, it's CO2 solid goes to CO2 gas. It's called dry ice because it never becomes a liquid. It goes directly from the solid to the gas. Unless you're at high pressure. That's another story. Okay. So we're going to start writing things as chemical equations. This is an example for, of a combustion reaction. I didn't write the heat here. Okay. So what we're going to. This side is known as the reactants. My internet is really slow. And that's what you made, right? So we call it the products. Now, because this is a combustion reaction, we know that heat is produced by it. So heat is one of the products. So oftentimes in a combustion reaction, we would put heat out here. Or we would write the amount of energy that left the reaction in that point. Okay. Yeah, like joules. Usually it's in kilojoules. Right? For a chemical reaction like this, it's for, for this kind of reaction, for every one mole of methane, you're probably generating 400 kilojoules. A lot of energy. Yeah, yeah four, no, 4,000, I think. I have to look at the numbers again. It's a lot. Okay, so now... Yeah. Yeah, I have to look at it. It's more than 400, but it's less than 4,000. I'll have to think about what that is. So these, those are the states. Okay, not Indiana, Idaho, not California. <laughs> like physical states. So gas, these are all gases. Okay, But we know water could have come out as a liquid. So if it had been water as a liquid, like condensation, you just put an L there. Okay, I'll show you what the state symbols are in a second. This guy in the middle... He's important. He divides the reactants and the products. And it's got a name like you might expect. It's called the reaction arrow. Now, your book really doesn't talk about the reaction arrow very much. So I'm going to add some stuff after I do the states. But there's a lot of different things that could be associated with the reaction arrow that tell you like what you need to do to make the reaction go. Okay, so I'll write those things in a second. Okay, so these are the states. 
as you would expect, right? Gas, liquid, solid. Those are the three physical states of matter. So there's a symbol for each one, and it's the first letter of each one. You always write in parentheses. They always write it in cursive. You don't have to. Right? You will also see, and I find this habit really annoying, people do this, CO2, and then they put G like that down at the bottom. But my eyes are getting to the point where I don't like that little G because I don't get bifocals because I, I can't walk with bifocals. <laughs> I get seasick. So, yeah, but some, sometimes they put a little G down. That, that implies that it's a gas. So if you're reading online and trying to get help, sometimes you'll see this little letter that's down here. Don't be confused by it. They often don't put parentheses. It's just one of the states. This fourth state that's down here, this is the new one. Okay. Aqueous simply means it's dissolved in water. A homogeneous solution, it's dissolved in water. Okay? So I'm going to put that little note there. It's a homogeneous solution in water. How's that? I was, I'm yelling. Um, it turns out if it was in like anything else, like if it was dissolved in ammonia or if it was dissolved in carbon disulfide, that would be, this AQ would be replaced by NH3 or CS2. Okay. So sometimes you'll see stuff that's different in here and that all that means it's dissolved in something that's not water. Carbon tetrachloride, those kinds of things. Organic chemists who would use carbon tetrachloride the most don't usually care about it, so I'll you know, put it in there. Okay. okay, so aspect of this reaction. Here's the same reaction that's down here, right? Mm -hmm. A chemical reaction is also a statement of the conservation of mass. Okay? So matter must be conserved. All they're saying is there have to be the same number of each atom on the left as there is on the right. So if you look at this reaction, right, they write it out like this, but if you look at it in picture form, the way it's written, there's a carbon, four hydrogens, right? Two oxygens, because it's O2, it's the diatomic. So there's two atoms of oxygen, there's two atoms of oxygen here, and there's another one over here, right? There's three oxygen atoms. There's also, just to make it more painful, four hydrogens and two hydrogens. So this reaction, this chemical reaction, is not showing conservation of mass. It needs to be balanced. Okay. What does that mean? That means I have to adjust the number of each product and reactant until the number of atoms on the left equals the number of atoms on the right of each type. So here's the simple answer. Okay? If you had, um, oh, that's not the simple answer, sorry. We're going to try to balance it. Here's the simple answer. If you have two waters and two oxygens coming in, right? notice what happens when you do your counting now. There's one, two, three, four hydrogens here. How many hydrogens are over there? Four. Now, they're in the form of water now, right? But this follows our rule of something new being made. How many oxygens are over here? Four. four. And how many do you see over here? Two. Yeah, there's two here and two here, right? Mm -hmm. So again, they're not in O2 anymore, but they're now in separate oxygen atoms. And then CO2, right? This all balances out. So there's only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We've covered them all. There's one carbon and one carbon. So this is balanced. So how do you know what these numbers are? You just fill them in and you see if it balances. It's called balancing by inspection. And then 
the way that you know like what goes with what is because those are common ions? Oh, no, the way you know like these is you're given those or you memorize. Like you need to know like a combustion reaction yeah. always produces CO2 with a hydrocarbon, produces CO2 in water. Okay, so we'll learn. We'll... You'll learn that. We'll okay. cover that in a slide. Okay. But basically, any hydrocarbon, oxygen, product, CO2 and water. So it could be ethanol. And oxygen, CO2 and water. It could be gasoline, which is hydrocarbon, and oxygen makes CO2 and water. And then you just have to get the numbers to balance. And it's just like a play, playing with, these are known as coefficients, all right? Because like, you know, math, the thing that you multiply by, these are all known as coefficients. You have to get the coefficients to make it work. And it's guesswork, okay? But it's kind of like finding um, my shoes in my house. I wake up in the morning, right? I don't look in the fireplace because I know I never put my... That's the way chemical equations work. There's a way to do it that always ends up getting you the right answer, okay? Okay, so I'm going to read this to you, and then we're just going to do it, okay? This is all the rules. I'm just going to go over what the, the different rules mean. If you don't understand it, it's okay, because we're going to do it, and you're going to learn it that way, kind of like osmo by osmosis, okay? So the first thing you have to do when you balance a chemical equation, you have to look at the names that you're given, and then write the formulas right. If you don't write the formulas right, it turns out you could make it so it could never balance. And then you would be sitting there putting numbers in front of things, and it would never come out, okay? So the first thing that you do is you look at the names you're given, and you write the formulas correctly. Review chapter five. And, you know, that was like weeks ago. Or two days ago, sorry. Three days ago? Okay. This is, this is considered, this, this second rule is considered to be one of those helpful things. If an element occurs at only one compound on both sides, right, of an equation, balance it first. Okay. If it's only in one compound on each side, then balance that one first. I call that the unique elements. You balance the unique ones first. If an element occurs as a free element on either side of the equation, you balance it last. Now, those two rules could conflict, so just try it either way. Here's the thing. You always know your equations balance just by counting atoms. And so it's like driving to Reedley. I now have like a dozen different ways I drive to Reedley. They all get me to Reedley, except the one that goes by the river. But the, <laughs> yeah, you eventually get to Reedley at some point. So if the balanced equation contains a coefficient of fractions, right, you change it to whole numbers by multiplying, like like you do for empirical molecular formula stuff that we talked about the last time. You get a fraction, and I'm going to show you why you get fractions in a second. You can get rid of fractions by multiplying the entire equation. Okay. At the end, you just check your work. You count up the atoms on the left. You count up the atoms on the right to make sure the type of each atom is the same. Okay. There's a couple of things you never do. Okay. Or one thing you never do. Once you get the formulas correct, don't change subscripts to balance things. So don't say that, oh, I have NaCl on one side. Oh, but I need another chlorine, so I'm just going to do that. That's like <coughs> forbidden because that's not no longer sodium chloride's formula, right? So you can't just change subscripts in formulas to do this. The only thing you do get to change is the numbers that go in front or the balancing coefficients or stoichiometric coefficients is another fancy word. That's the next chapter, so I'll save it. <laughs> is that why they sometimes write the two in front instead of below? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do this one, okay? Balance equation, write a balanced equation for the reaction between solid chromium-3 oxide. What's chromium-3 oxide? So... I'm going to write chromium, oops, I am going to write chromium, CR3+, plus, and oxide, that means what? Monatomic, so it's O2 minus. So what's the formula going to be? 
Cr2O3. So we're going to just cross these over like this. So chromium 3 oxide is Cr2O3. Okay. And solid carbon, well, that's kind of a, a simple one. Uh, it sounds confusing, but that's just C with a solid. Okay. And to produce solid chromium and carbon dioxide gas. So I'm going to go like this. C, solid, CR, solid, plus CO2. Okay. First thing you do, just check. Is it balanced? Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but you gotta check that first, right? Element by itself you would leave last, by the way, but there's one carbon, one carbon. Um, there's three oxygens, and there's two oxygens. So that didn't work out, right? Yeah. And there's uh, chromium and two chromium. So, so what I'm gonna do is it says to leave these guys for last. The reason I'm leaving those ones for last is because it's an element by, it's a pure element by itself, okay? And oddly enough, the oxygen here and the oxygen here, right, only occur in one compound. So the rule is, right, you write everything with its states, sorry, wrote the gas. And then the first thing you focus on is the element that occurs only once on each side. Oh, I got three here, and I got two here. I can't change the subscripts. What am I going to do so that I have the same number of oxygens on both sides? I can use coefficients. Go ahead. Uh, three molecules of chromium is two of carbon dioxide? That's close. You have the right, right, right idea. Right, because if I... There's a three here, so I need a three here. Mm -hmm. There's a two on this oxygen, so I need a two here. Yeah. So it's, it's just like crossing a common denominator. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a three here. And a, no. no, I did. See, I did the wrong way. You did the way you were told. Two here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm good at that, by the way. Three here. So what that's done for me is I have six oxygens here and six oxygens here. So that part's balanced. Okay. I'll show you a couple of ways to do these things. So the oxygen is balanced. Now I can do the other elements. Now, how many chromiums do I have on this side? Two times two. So I've got a total of four. So in order to make this work, I need to put a four in front of here. Okay. What do you call that number? Do you just call it a coefficient? Yeah, coefficient. Uh, later we're going to call it a stoichiometric coefficient because we do something with it called stoichiometry. Why do you start with the O again? Oh, two, uh, two rules. One is uh, leave elements that occur by themselves right. till last. So it's this and this. And the other one is, if an element occurs uniquely in one compound on either side, on both sides, right, balance that one first. So like this one, there's oxygen in here, and there's an oxygen in here, right? So you could do that, start with that one. Um, so you can, uh, you can change the subscript when you're doing something with, like, ionization, but when it's a chemical reaction... Yeah, like, when you're doing chemical reactions, subscripts change. But when you're balancing reactions, you're not changing subscripts. Okay, because then you're changing what it means. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I'll, that, that I'll clarify later. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, so now, how many carbons do I need? How many chromiums? I need six is what I decided? No, four. How many carbons do I need? Three. All right, so that one's balanced, okay? How do I know that? I just go through and I count the atoms. 
On the left, I have four CRs. On the right, I have four CRs. On the left, I have six oxygens. On the right, I have three times two. That's over here. I have six oxygens. And uh, what's the other thing left? This carbon, right? On the left, I have three carbons. And on the right, I have these guys, three carbons. So the number of elements of each type is the same on both sides. So mass on the left, mass on the right are the same. That's why I say it's mass balanced. The actually, actually, the term for uh, balancing chemical reactions, another term you'll see for it's called mass balancing a reaction. Okay? Because what you're doing is following conservation mass. All right, let's do another one. Ah, combustion of... Oh, you can't... Oh, shoot, that's too bad. It's butane. Um, yeah, it's butane. There's a nice mnemonic for remembering methyl, methane, eth, methane, ethane, propane, butane, but I'll get to it some other day. So C4, H10, okay? And gaseous oxygen, so this is going to be gas and O2 gas form CO2 and water, combustion reaction, right? I didn't actually even have to tell you that. You could have, at some point in the future, when I, we talk about it more, just guess guessed it's CO2 and water. It's a good guess. Yeah, it's a good guess, usually. I'm putting a little space. I'm going to put the gas down like this because it's just... I usually don't balance with the coefficients in. I usually leave them off because... Not the coefficients. I don't, usually don't balance with the states in because they're kind of a pain and they get in the way and I hate writing them over and over and over again. Okay. okay, so let me ask you, what are the rules? Well, if it's unique in both sides, I could do that one first. And the other rule is if it's an element that's by itself on one side, you leave it to last. So what am I leaving to last? Oxygen. So I'm going to balance this one at the very end, right? But carbon and carbon, one compound on each side. Hydrogen and hydrogen, one compound on each side. So I could start with either CO2 or the hydrogen and balance with this guy here. Okay? So my piece of advice, okay, pick a compound, balance everything in that compound with everything else on the other side. So I am going to, before I do anything else, let's have four carbons here. So how many CO2s do I need? Four. Now, I have, sticking with this compound, right, ten hydrogens. How many H2Os do I need? Five. So, so carbons are balanced, hydrogens are balanced. The only thing left is oxygen. And in fact, that's why you leave this one till last, because if you did it first and then you changed one of these coefficients, you've got to go back and you've got to do it again. Okay? So you leave it to last. It's kind of like a fudge factor. Okay, so now, I know carbons, hydrogens are balanced. How many oxygens are on the right side? Yeah, 13. There's 4 times 2 plus 5. That's 13. I need 13 oxygens on the left side. What's the problem with what I just said? Comes in twos, right? So what would you multiply by 2 and get 13? 13, six and a half, right? Now, the simple way to think about it, like my simple brain says, I want 13, it comes in twos. That's six and a half, okay? I wanted 13 over here. That's this number here. It comes in twos, and that gives me that ratio. Now, I, I can't have half a molecule. So what I have to do, and this is one of those rules, multiply everything 
to get whole numbers. Well, what am I going to multiply this by to get a whole number? Two. Two. Whatever's down here, right? So I'm going to think about it like this. I'm going to take this whole thing and multiply it by two. When I do that, how many of these will I have? Two. Two. Two, C, four. And this is where I would throw the states back in, because I'm almost done. Gas. Plus, how many oxygens will I have? 13, because I'm going 2 times 13 over 2, so the 2s will cancel. So I get 13 O2s. You're just doing a square of the fraction, right? You're not changing the values. Yeah, I'm not changing the... I'm not changing the balancing of it. I'm just changing it to get rid of the fraction because it can't have half an oxygen. How many CO2s will I have? Eight CO2s. And then I'll have 10 waters. Now, these are gases. So if you're really neurotic, which you should be, Right, you're running on very little sleep. I had an energy drink at like 8 o'clock last night just so I could get through the rest of my evening. I'd go to a baseball game. I'd grade. I'd record scores. I'd look at lecture notes. Look at schedule. <sighs> yeah, anyways. It's a good life, actually. <laughs> but like I said, you have to be a little neurotic. You know, all that caffeine does something to you. Ah, let's see if this worked. How many? Oh, oh, forgot the oxygen gas, huh? Um, how many carbons do I have? Eight. And then on the right, how many carbons do I have? Eight. So far, so good, right? Because when it doesn't work out, you're usually really ticked off. How many hydrogens do you have? Well, there's the two here, right? This two goes with this 10. It multiplies across, so there's 20 hydrogens, okay? Oops, that's two hydrogens. There we go. Um, how many do I have on that side? 20, because it's this 10 with, goes with this two, so I get 20 hydrogens. So, so far, so good, right? Now i got to do the oxygens. This one always screwed up. So, in CO2, the oxygens that I have are 8 times 2, so there's 16 there. And then I have 10 from H2O. So, that's 10 O's. So, that's 26 oxygens, right? It looks like 260, I know. Sorry. Do this. So, what do I have here? 26 oxygen. 26 oxygen because it's O2. And so it's balanced, okay? One more example. Again, you can see how this stuff really depends on nomenclature. So what I'm going to do is I will write out, make sure we get the formulas right. I will help you write those out. I'll give you a few minutes to balance it, and then we'll go over it in class, okay? So write the balance equation for the reaction of aqueous lead acetates. I'm going to leave the state off. So that's lead 2 would be PB2 plus. Okay, so that's what I'm dealing with. i got to write the formula, so it means i got PB2 plus. And acetate. C, 2, H, 3, O, 2. What's the charge? Anybody remember? Negative, Negative 1. Okay. With aqueous or aqueous potassium iodide. Now, potassium is K plus, and iodide is I minus. Okay. So I'm going to get a compound out of these. I'm going to get a compound out of these. And then lead... Iodide. 
right? I already got the formulas, right? So I'm going to write, start writing the reactions. I got the formulas for the ions. The reactants look like this. P, B, C, 3, H, sorry, C, 2, H, 3, O, 2. There's two of them to get the charge to balance. Because that's a, lead's a plus 2, right? And acetate's a minus 1, so I have to put this in parentheses in a subscript 2. Plus, formula for potassium iodide is just Ki. And these form, what does it say? Lead 2 iodide. So this is lead 2, and this is iodide. So how many iodides do I need for every lead? I need two, right? So it's going to be PBI2. And potassium acetate is one in one, right? And by the way, this is an example. It forms a solid, a precipitation reaction. So, um, where was I? K, oh, there we go. Potassium acetate. I could have made some joke there, but I decided to pass on it. H2, H3O2. Like that. All right, you guys figure out how to balance that. I'll pause this up here. So let me try to take a picture of this thing. All right, so there it is. Okay, it's your solubility table. And look what it says at the very top says group or ion. Now you notice that most of these, in fact, all but one of them is negatively charged. So when you're trying to determine solubility, the thing that you look at is not the first thing, it's the second thing, it's the anion, okay? So for example, if I had sodium acetate, right? I would, this is another way to write acetate. If I wanted to know whether or not sodium acetate is soluble, I would look it up according to its anion. Okay. And what does it say? Generally soluble with the stated exceptions. Right? So anything with these ions in it, these are all soluble. So nitrates right, are all soluble. Acetates are all soluble. On the other hand, you know, sodium chloride is soluble. Chlorides, bromides, iodides... These are generally soluble with these exceptions. The exceptions are with silver. This is known as the mercury one ion, actually, and lead two plus. So if I have lead two plus and any of these halogens, it's going to be insoluble, and that will be a solid in the solution. It will not dissolve, or it would, in other words, be a solid inside. The solution would be opaque if you try to dissolve it. Stir it in, it would just make a cloud, and you wouldn't be able to see through it. Okay, now, here, this list, the second list, generally insoluble. So if I have carbonates and phosphates, those are almost always insoluble, which means they're solid, okay? Don't dissolve, except for group one. So which is group one? Group one is the first group. Those are generally always soluble. And combined with ammonium ion, those are generally always soluble. Okay? And you'll notice up here, right? Group 1A, 2A, right? These are always soluble, except slightly soluble with some of these things. Slightly soluble is one of those voodoo topics I hate talking about in 3A, because it's kind of like the gray area. When we say it's soluble, a lot of it dissolves. When we say it's Insoluble, almost none of it dissolves. And when we say slightly soluble, well, a little bit dissolves. So when you're asking somebody, is it going to precipitate or not, it depends on how much there is. So it's really hard to talk about that in a 3A class. 
Okay. Um, so get your solubility rules. That's the ones we have, right? And I have CUS. So I'm going to look up, do I look up copper or do I look up sulfur? Sulfur. Sulfur. And this is S2 minus sulfide, right? So I'm going to go down my list. And it says, where do you find sulfide? Very second from the bottom, right? S2 minus. Generally insoluble except these ones that they're saying here. Now is copper in that list? No. So, soluble or insoluble, that one is insoluble. Oh, I lost the little tip to my little thingy. Fell off. Hang on. Can't write with that. There we go. Insoluble. Now, this is a little confusing. When you see it in a form, uh, chemical equation, it's going to say this then. The S, insoluble, means it's a solid, and so you'll see an S after it for insoluble or solid, okay? FeSO4, so that's a sulfate, right? So I'm going to look up the sulfate. A lot of times I just tell people, just do that and look it up, okay? Just cover it and look it up. So I'm um, looking on my chart where are sulfates. Soluble. Soluble. Now, except those containing, you see iron in that list? So that's soluble. That means if you see it in a reaction, it'll often look like this. Because when we say it's soluble, it means it dissolves and makes an aqueous solution. It'll look like that with an AQ after it. Lead carbonate. Carbonates are generally insoluble, so that's insoluble. If you were to write it in a form, uh, chemical equation, right, it would be PbCO3, and the symbol is S as a solid. Insoluble doesn't dissolve, okay? NH4Cl, well, generally speaking, NH4, it's at the top, are always soluble. Um, it turns out it's not always, but it's pretty close to always. <laughs> it's always soluble, so we would say that's soluble. So ammonium chloride would look like this in a chemical equation. Like that. Okay, got that little skill down? We're going to use it over and over and over again now. <laughs> so have your handy-dandy chart. You don't need your handy-dandy calculator today. Okay. All right. Just to give you an example, here's, here's um, you notice this is potassium iodide, right? And this is, in here, lead nitrate. All right. And they're taking the potassium iodide and mixing lead nitrate with it. So, you see this, right? This is lead to iodide. This is a, what is what do we call this? It's a precipitate, right? It's a solid that forms in the reaction. So, I'm going to draw this big on the board over here. Because it's on the slides, but I, I like to draw these things out. So, if I think about Ki... Aqueous, I can have it in a beaker. All right. What's in the solution for Ki aqueous? I know it sounds like a silly question. Potassium ions and iodide ions. It's, there's actually no Ki in a Ki solution. It's K-ions and I-ions. And because they're aqueous and they, they dissolve, they separate into their ions. So in this solution, you have a situation where 
you might have something like this. And it's always going to be balanced, electrically neutral, but you have all these ions that are floating around separate from each other. There's really no Ki in Ki aqueous. Uh, there's Ks and there's Is. So if you think about what that means, like for a lead nitrate, Right. PBNO32. By the way, I'm labeling my beaker so I know what's in it. All right. That's what you're supposed to do. What do I actually have in there? If it's aqueous, right, it's PB2 plus and nitrates floating around. The ratio is still 2 to 1 because that's how you put it in. but they're just kind of floating around, separated out by a bunch of water molecules. Try to balance out the charges a little bit. Okay, so um, just real quickly, just because you mix, just because you mix two ionic compounds is, together doesn't mean something comes out, okay? So when you mix two ionic compounds together, not always, there isn't always something that precipitates out. So here's, for example, Ki and NaCl. Right? You mix them together, potassium iodide, sodium chloride, you mix them together, and what do you see? Well, you just see two solutions mixing. So in here, right, potassium is soluble with iodide. You know that already because it says that. But also potassium chloride is soluble. So nothing in that mixture will be a solid. Nothing precipitates out. When that happens, all you write, you, you, you write is no reaction. And those are the, the easy ones. Okay, so um, we're going to do some examples. I'm going to skip over some of this, some of the stuff I was talking about, what was going on. And I'm just going to show you how to do it. Those are some of the uh, instructions. Okay, write an equation for the precipitation reaction. The curse, if any, it always says that or not. Right? If none recurs, usually it tells you write no reaction. When solutions of potassium hydroxide and nickel-3 bromide are mixed, first thing you have to do is write out all the ions that they just mentioned in there, okay? So, I have potassium hydroxide, so it's K plus, and hydroxide is OH minus... And then you have nickel 3 bromide, that's Ni3 plus, and Br. Oh, it's nickel 2. Thank goodness. I'm like, I've never oh, seen nickel 3. That's okay. Oh, no, that's totally okay. Um, there. So that's, those are the ions, right? So let me show you something, just a real quick thought, okay? This is what forms your reactants, okay? Remember, like, when you have these precipitation reactions take place, one of the metals leaves with a different date, right? So they switch partners. It's sort of like, sort of like square dancing, right? You switch your partners all the time. So basically... <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Potassium on the product side would be with the bromine, yeah. and the nickel would be with the OH minus. Okay. It's not going to hook up with metal. No, it's because remember the reason these get together is opposite charges attract each other, so metals don't leave the party together. Metals always leave with the non-metals. I realize that's almost offensive. I apologize. <laughs> That was a marginal statement. <laughs> Didn't mean it that way. So uh, <laughs> you should be the one laughing and leaving the room now. So nickel <laughs> positives always go with negatives. That's basically the rule, right? You can't have two positives leaving. You can't have two negatives leaving. Okay, so um, let's write the reactants. <laughs> I'm trying to recover from my social faux pas here. So the reactants are KOH. Okay. What else? 
and IBR2. And my products, you know, the, I tell some people, you know, if you, if you have a hard time remembering, just remember like the FOIL method. Remember FOIL, outside first, outside, inside, last. But this is just the outside and the inside. So this is the OI method. OI. All right. Or I'll stop telling jokes. I haven't told my nitrate joke yet. So, uh, <laughs> so what goes with what now? Nickel goes with hydroxide. So we're predicting what the products of the reaction would be. Yeah. And then what else is there? It's potassium and bromide. That's the outside part. So this is the outside, right? This is the inside. That's all you're doing. So if I do the outside part now, it's KBr. Now remember, right? More positively charged metal, more metally ones on the left go first. And if you look at the periodic table, that's where they are on the periodic table. Sorry, why did you put the two on the OH? On the oh, oh, what's the charge of OH? And what's the charge of nickel? Oh. So I need two to get. So, so one of the things that you know the skills that we practice like so yesterday and the day before, right? Yeah. We're trying to get back to the formula. So, okay, so bring that down, and then when you do this other side. You do the outside-inside part, yeah. So here's the thing. Get these right, because if you get them wrong, then everything's wrong, okay? So now what we're going to do to determine whether or not a reaction takes place, we're going to look up the solubility rules for each one of these, okay? Now, if you look up potassium, right, group 1A, this is... One of those things you should remember, 1A is always soluble. So if you see, oh, that's soluble and that's soluble, because you know potassium's in group one. So I know already that it, KOH is aqueous and KBR is aqueous. I'm doing what I don't like. I'm writing at the bottom because I don't have space. Um, that leaves me looking at bromides. If you look at bromide, silver, mercury, and lead are the exceptions, but these are gen gen generally soluble. I haven't even started drinking yet. Okay, so AQ. <laughs> yet. So, <laughs> and now hydroxides. Those are generally insoluble. That's nickel. Is nickel on this sheet as an exception? No. So that's the solid in the reaction, okay? So I'm going to put an S here. And so now I know a reaction occurs when you mix these two things together. So, hmm, is it balanced? It's not balanced. So now I'm going to balance it. Um, let's start with, for example, uh, hydroxide, because it's here and here, so I need two of these to balance the two hydroxides that are in here. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to drop this in. And then I need two potassiums, because now I just created two potassiums over here. But again, it's like the Alice in Wonderland thing. I started here. I'm working my way through the map. I'm over here. So how many KBRs do I really need? I actually need two. Nickels are balanced, OHs are balanced, bromines are balanced. So this is done. Okay. So this is the balanced reaction for the precipitation reaction that occurs when a solution of potassium hydroxide and nickel two bromide are mixed. And if this had been aqueous, it would have been a no reaction because there's no solids formed. It depends on the question. Sometimes it says, if a reaction occurs, balance it. And if it doesn't, then you're just done. It's like, right, no reaction. That's why I say those are nice ones, because they're quick. You're just usually just done with 
would one example be without another example? Okay. Write an equation for the precip precipitation reaction that occurs, if any, when solutions of ammonium chloride and iron 3 nitrate are mixed. So ammonium chloride, uh, ammonium is what, NH4+, plus. Chloride, Cl minus. Um, iron nitrate is Fe three plus because it says iron three nitrate. Sorry, I didn't say that part out loud. And NO three minus. Okay, so um, my reactants are NH four Cl. plus Fe, right, NO3, 3, make, and then you have to do that inside-outside part. So always remember metal, metal, is, metal or positive charge goes first. So the ammonium goes with nitrate, so I'll do that one first. That's that fertilizer stuff, by the way. Plus ferric or sorry iron three chloride Fe Cl three or it's also called ferric chloride that's why I just start blabbling it out. Okay, now we need to look up states. Oh, guess what? Ammonium. That's one of those ones you should memorize. Ammonium and group ones are generally soluble. So if I remember that, this is aqueous and this is aqueous. So I can just write AQ because these both contain ammonium. So this is going to be AQ. And this is going to be AQ. Now, ferric nitrate, nitrate is one of those ones to remember that is generally soluble. So that's also going to be AQ. So what am I left with? I just have to look up the ferric chloride. Chlorides are generally soluble. So that's going to be, and the iron's not the ex, an exception, so that's AQ. Oh, look, they're all aqueous. What does that mean? No reaction. NR, no reaction. I told a joke in chemistry. Do you know this one? It's no reaction. But I'm bunch. Really, do you know why chemists like nitrates so much? Because they're better than the day rates. That was pretty bad. See, no reaction. <laughs> nitrates, day rates. Sorry. Okay, I'm only about halfway through this chapter. I'll have to finish it tomorrow. In lab. Yeah, they're done. Oh, yeah. You were going to remind me of something. Yes, on the next exam, and I'm recording this, if you want to hold me to it, you get to have a 3 by 5 card handwritten on the, the test. Both sides and the edges. I always throw that in as a bonus. Right. Anything you want to write on it. Okay, now here's the one thing that I request that you do, otherwise you're going to have to spend some of your exam time doing it while I find scotch tape, is once you're done writing it, put scotch tape over both sides, because I've had the experience where students don't do that, and what they're actually doing is using the card to pass notes with, uh, across each other, like they write answers to problems on it, and then they slide cards back and forth. Okay. I'm telling you all these ways to cheat, because I'm assuming you're not going to do it, but I'm trying to also tell you not to do it. If I catch anybody cheating, I always give them an F for the semester. That's just like what I do, okay? Yeah, oh, on the writing, so that it's both sides got tape on it, so you can't write on it anymore. So have it done before you get here, or do it right before you take the test. Can I get my study guide?